So when did the hip hop thing come around? Well, okay, after I left the 75, I went into the 81 detective squad and I got put on a homicide team. While I was in the 81 squad, I was already looking into the hip hop industry because they had come across my desk with a few homicides. I had a few homicides involving guys that were in the um, rap music industry. So what happened was that uh, I was promoted to the Cold Case Squad. And that's when the hip hop world really came together. While I was in Cold Cases, I was going around uh, dealing with um, unsolved murders in uh, the whole borough of New York. And I was traveling to different cities, bringing people back for murders. And uh, what happened was that I had told the commissioner, I think it was Ed Norris at the time, about this hip hop world. And I was telling him about the murders and things were going on. I mean, he listened to me, but nobody really took it really seriously until Tupac got killed, opened up some eyes. But when Biggie Smalls got killed, that's when I told my, my boss, who was an inspector at the time, about the murder of Biggie is going to come back to New York. And he said, Derek, look, they don't kill people in rock and roll. So leave this rap stuff alone. It's none of our business. Right, but Biggie got killed in L.A. I know, but it was coming back to New York. And the reason it was coming back to New York because he's a Brooklyn native. And sure enough, when they started getting all the death threats at the funeral home, the Frank Gamble funeral home, against Puffy, Faith, um, Kim, every, all these things started coming up. Now the police department grew very concerned because of the amount of publicity and the, um, the attention it was getting. So that's when the commissioner said, Derek, you need to come down here and explain to myself and the chief and the commissioner what's going on with this rap music industry because now it's becoming violent. Okay, so then what happened? Okay, so when I went down and spoke with them, I spent four hours at the police headquarters briefing them on this East Coast, West Coast feud between Bad Boy and Death Row. And I told them how it started, you know, with the thing in Atlanta with Jake Robles and how the thing is in L.A. and New York and Puffy and, and Suge Knight. And then it watered down to Biggie and Tupac, even though they were friends at one time. So after I explained all of this, um, they assigned me to the funeral home. They said, you're going to be at the funeral home. But while I was in the cold case squad, my bosses were getting very upset with me because they didn't want me to leave cold case because I was solving a great deal of murders and going into this rap stuff full time because my captain at the time felt he wasn't gonna get anything out of it. Like, why are you helping these other units when it's not, you're not, I'm not getting recognized you're being one of my men. Uh, but the police commissioner wasn't having that and neither was the deputy commissioners and the chief. They were like, listen, you will come, you will be at their funeral home and you will brief us on everything. So I had to set up sort of a coordination plan with the uh, our SWAT guys that you call ESU guys here and the LAPD, LAPD flew here and I met with them and uh, we all had uh, you know, worked together during the funeral because they were very surprised. They were overwhelmed. They said, Derek, we don't know much about this rap music industry. This case just fell into our laps at the Wilshire Peterkin Museum out in LA. And I said, look, I knew all about this. And I said, you know, this was bound to happen. I knew it was gonna happen. And uh, I tried to warn the police department back then, but like I said, they didn't see this like I saw it. Because not only being a cop, but I was a hip hop fan myself. And I had been looking and monitoring things that were going on between these worlds, between Death Row and Bad Boy. Okay. So what happened was that uh, uh, the death threats at the funeral home, uh, I had to be present when they brought Biggie's body back from LA. So I was in the, one of the very few people to see his body before he was, you know, uh, for made public, what took the, the cops up from the um, Manhattan precinct, the 2-0. And then, uh, you know, I mean, I, I was assigned there for like maybe a week at the funeral just to make sure there was no violence. We had cops stationed everywhere. There were bomb threats against the funeral home, death threats against Puffy. There was a lot going on, and the police department did not know where to turn to. Okay, and I guess you had flown out to Vegas after Tupac Well, when Tupac got killed, I went out to Vegas, and I set up a tag plan out there with the Vegas PD. Um, but the problem I had in Vegas was that Vegas PD didn't trust LAPD, and that was a big problem. Uh, sometimes as cops, and we all are, are cops in, in the business that we do, we get territorial. And Vegas became territorial with L.A. And then they felt that a lot of the stuff was coming from L.A. And then there was a corruptible, a corruptible angle that was attached to it. So they didn't trust anyone. Okay. So from your point of view, when you look at the Tupac and Biggie murders, from based on what you know and the intelligence that you got as a police officer. Let's start with Tupac first. 
Okay. Uh, how, how involved were you in, involved in the case at all? I was involved somewhat because I was involved afterwards when he got shot and killed in Vegas. I was involved afterwards, and I tried to help Las Vegas PD with the investigation because I knew that the perpetrators or the guys that were involved were all LA based, okay. pretty much, and I tried to tell them that. Um, of course, Vegas PD wasn't so cooperative back then. Um, but when I went out there to help them, we went to the, the Mike Tyson Selden fight. And I think we were stationed out there to see if there was no more repeat violence that was going to occur as a result of the Tupac thing with, at, okay. in Vegas. So they were concerned about that. And while I was out there, I tried to help them. But it didn't really work too well because Vegas PD was very tight lipped about what they were doing. Yeah. And I've interviewed Chris Carroll, who was the guy who showed up. Uh, at the scene when Tupac got killed. Right. I interviewed Greg Kading. Right, Greg Kading. Who, who ended up investigating the, the Tupac and Biggie murders from, from the LAPD side. Right. Um, I also interviewed a couple of guys from Compton PD that were sort of involved in the, in the whole investigation. Right. Uh, based on what you know, who killed Tupac? Well, Orlando Anderson is dead. Uh, he's one of the guys that was involved in uh, Tupac's death. Okay. And that's there were several others. I think Greg Kading proved a lot of that in his um, murder rap yeah. uh, thing that he did his documentary. He did a pretty good job, by the way. But, you know, Greg was like more the third string of guys that handled that case. I was there in the beginning. So you had uh, Russell Poole, who's now deceased. Mm -hmm. And then you had um, Steve Katz, who was the second guy. And then I think Greg Kading became the third detective that was involved. Well, actually, the first group of detectives were Jackson Edwards. But they weren't in robbery homicide. That's why Poole took it over. Yeah. So they were like, the case was passed through like several hands before it got to Greg. Right. And even though people say it was Orlando Anderson who's now deceased, the case was never officially solved. No. And there's a reason why. Why? Well, you got to remember something. Greg Kading proved the theory about Keefe D. I think everybody saw that. Right. And Keefe D recently didn't, well, there was some audio about Keefe D admitting to Orlando and being in the car. Right. When the shooting happened and said that Orlando did the shooting. Right. And there's a new interview that's starting to circulate that Keefe D did as well. Right. And then there was a deconstruction video that came out about yeah. saying that uh, Greg Katie made all of this up and that. I said, no, that's that's not true. I mean, I, Greg did a good job on it. And uh, I think he pretty much got close to what was what happened. We I know for a fact that the guys that were in the car are mostly deceased anyway that were involved in. Um, yeah. Keefe D is the know. only living member in the car right now. Right, in the Tupac. The Tupac right. killing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when it, when it came to Biggie, you know, Greg Kading proved another guy was involved in that. Okay, who was that? And that was Pucci, this guy Pucci, he mentions. Okay. Eduardo Fenderson. Okay. So, what was the reasoning behind the Biggie murder, according to what you know? Well, there was a couple of theories. The first one was, it was retaliation for what happened to Tupac in Vegas. Uh, that... Is somewhat, I mean, it was looked at, but that wasn't the real reason. I think the real reason, too, was there was a uh, money was supposed to be paid to some Crips for protection with Biggie out in L.A., and I think that some of the money got reneged on. I think some of the payment was, was the initial down payment was put down, but the balance was never paid. That was, that was a really, really good reason why. That was one of the other good reasons why. Then the third one was about Suge, Suge Knight. You know, his name, name came up. Not, I'm not saying it now, this has been all public information about you know, him uh, being involved. I mean, we knew all of this back then, that you know, Suge had his dislike for Biggie and for Bad Boy, you know? So these were the plausible reasons that came up. And in Greg Kading's murder rap uh, investigation, he brings out a lot of that stuff about what happened, you know? Which is pretty much true because I was out there at the beginning and all these names came up back then. They're not new. I knew these names way back when it, when it happened. Okay. All these years later, both these murders are unsolved. Correct. Why do you think that is? Okay. Let's start with the Tupac murder. The reason that the Tupac murder is unsolved is because you have Keefe D saying that these guys did it. You can't have a co-conspirator and in, in the case give his testimony to be credible against uh, a crime that took place with another individual. You need some sort of corroboration. And there's no real corroboration that anybody else who was in that car or any other witnesses that said that he did that or that Orlando did that. So that case is open right now. If Keefe D confesses, yeah, and said he did it. Well, he confessed. He, which he did. No, he confessed he did. that Orlando did it. He was in the car. Right, which he did, but he's still acting in concert. He's there. 
he's in the car, Orlando shoots, but he's still one of the guys that was involved in that case. Right. However, the DA's office doesn't feel strong enough to go against that right now. They probably well, have enough evidence. But, but I interviewed Greg Kading, and he told me that... It's a... Uh Almost like, a, almost like a limited immunity. Now, if other people came forward and we were to able, able to gather evidence against Keefe D through other sources, he could certainly be charged. Under this agreement, he just couldn't be charged based on his own self-incriminating statements. So that's where the protection lied. He'd cooperate and we would take what he had to tell us and it wouldn't be used against him. However, we could take what he had to tell us and use it against anybody else he implicated uh, but just not himself. That's because he was probably proffered in the federal system. Right. Well, he he was uh, he was basically had a big drug case against him, and they offered to drop the drug case in exchange for testimony about the Tupac murder, and it it couldn't be used against him. Like his actual words couldn't be used against him, and he ended up getting off the drug case as well. Yeah, but see that that's the problem right now because even if he gave information and he let's say he made a deal and he got out of his drug uh, conviction, or they were gonna prosecute him for the drugs. Yeah. Where is it gonna go if he gives the information? Where, what, is, what would the police or the DA's office get out of it? They get, get that he was in the car with Orlando and not prosecute him for that murder? That makes no sense. But, but that was part of the deal. No, but you, you understand what I'm saying? Well, I, I, cause I interviewed Craig Kading about it. We went into detail on that. I, I, I get that. Yeah. I totally get what you're saying. But by him getting out of the drug deal, and giving up, he would have to, I think the way it would work with us, and correct me if I'm wrong, but he would have to give the information up and say, hey, I was part of it. And then they would either sentence him or reduce his sentence or something, because he gave it up. But the problem that you don't have is that you don't have anyone else saying that, yeah, Keefe D was in the car, yeah, I saw Orlando pull it. There's no other uncooperative witness that could come forward and say that. Right, because everyone's dead. So why, right, why, they, why would they do that and not prosecute a case? You know what I'm saying? Well, but, but, but that's what I'm saying. It's part of the deal. Like, he wouldn't... The whole point is that he wasn't going to uh, admit to being an accessory to a murder if that could turn around and put him in jail for life. But what would the DA's office get out of it by him confessing that this guy did it? I guess they felt that his testimony was going to help them put together a bigger case, but ultimately what, what Greg told me was that... At this point in time, you know, so much money and resources and uh, manpower had been spent trying to investigate this case and to defend the city, they just, uh, they just walked away from it all. Well, that's, that's, that's a plausible answer because yeah. the problem is if, if Keefe D gave up that he saw Orlando shoot um, Tupac and he was in the car, what are they going to get out of it by him saying that if they're not going to prosecute him? Him getting out from the drug case, that makes no sense because, and, and I know in New York, if that was here or in our city, that they would make him plead to the drug case and if he's doing 15 years, then you exceptionally clear the murder of Tupac because he's already doing that much time. So the DA's office will be right. They'll just leave it alone because he's already doing time and it's not going to matter anymore about going after him because he's already doing 15, 20 years. You follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that would, the case had to be exceptionally cleared, especially with the police department where they have to write up a brilliant novel as to what happened, who was in the car, and why they're not able to prosecute this case and therefore it should be closed. Okay. But then and ultimately, in the Biggie case, how come nobody got caught okay. and nobody got prosecuted? The Biggie case is another problem. The problem you had in the Biggie case is, again, you have witnesses and then you have the corroboration of other people. And then you got to remember the, the, the problem with the LAPD, from what I remember, is the corruption angle of it, you know, that Russell Poole stumbled on with the guys that were bodyguarding Suge Knight, you know, the two cops, Mac and uh, the other detective that were, that were um, at the time bodyguarding him. And then the corruption with the lawsuits with the Biggie family, Greg is right on that respect because the LAPD, if they even bring somebody to prosecution, they're going to have such a tough time convicting them because of all the intangibles of this case and all the damaging things that have happened in the course of this investigation. Right, and you're dealing with multimillionaires who, exactly. who are going to... That have, have money. Who have money. Have good attorneys. Yep. So the, the, and the DA's office doesn't feel it's a slam dunk case that they could go anywhere with it. That's why these cases are both going to be dormant, you know? Forever. Forever. So at, at this point. Right. So based on your professional opinion as a former police officer, 
Biggie and Tupac murder cases will never be solved. I don't think they'll ever be solved. Officially. That's my opinion right now. Yeah. Uh, unless something miraculously comes up, but I doubt it. And uh, I think we know who did it. We know who was involved with both murders. But I just don't see that going anywhere.